all so much for being here today. I'm honored to be speaking here. This is my very first NeuroFest, and I'm looking forward to attending as a community member in the years to come. And so today I'm going to be talking about something that's probably been on a lot of our minds over the past couple of years, which is our mental health and how we can think about improving our mental health. And so mental health conditions, whether it's um, a very serious mental condition you suffer from or whether you're experiencing symptoms of one, can really affect our daily lives, right? So we can experience symptoms such as anxiety, feelings of hopelessness, feeling antisocial, et cetera. And this can influence the way that we sort of experience the world, make it hard to engage with family or friends, or even make it harder for us to do our work. And these symptoms, while some of them um, can, rather than just one of these symptoms being assigned to one specific type of mental disorder, they're actually shared among many different types of conditions that we, we think and talk about. And the key, a key issue that our neuroscience researchers is trying to address is how can we treat these symptoms and conditions to improve our daily lives and the lives of patients that are suffering from these conditions. So first, I just want to give you a very brief history of kind of what the first types of um, antidepressant medications were developed. And one of the first ones really came about in the 1950s from sort of an unexpected side effect of a completely different type of drug. And so this is a drug that in the 1950s was being prescribed to treat TB or tuberculosis. So this is an antibiotic. And what patients were uh, reporting is that many of them that were under this medication were experiencing side effects of euphoria. And patients that were suffering from depression were all actually reporting that they could feel their symptoms kind of going away after being on this medication. Around the same time, there was a completely different drug that was being used to treat blood pressure. And this had the complete opposite effect. Patients under recipine were reporting that, hey, actually, I'm starting to feel withdrawn. And many of them were saying, I'm, I'm starting to feeling symptoms of something like depression. And this led people to wonder, OK, what are these drugs actually doing in the brain? They're not supposed to be doing anything you know, towards our mental health. These are supposed to be treating physiological disorders. What's going on? It turns out that what these drugs were doing is altering levels of different types of neurochemicals in the synapses between our, our brain regions. And so this TB medication was actually increasing the levels of these neurochemicals in our synapses, and that was associated with euphoria, whereas this blood pressure medication was actually decreasing the levels of these neurochemicals in our synapses, which was causing patients to feel, perhaps, symptoms of depression. And from this sort of serendipitous finding, this TB medication was actually one of the first antidepressants that were being prescribed to try and, and, and treat um, this disorder. So studies like these led to this, this early theory, this sort of prevailing theory that many people have held for a long time, that Many mental health conditions or neuropsychiatric diseases are caused by something like a chemical imbalance in the brain. So you may be familiar uh, with that term. And some of these neurochemicals that are thought to be involved include serotonin, which you, know, you may sometimes hear people talking about, oh, I need, I need a serotonin boost or some energy boost to help me get through my day. Another neurochemical called dopamine. This is thought of as the pleasure molecule. And also another one called norepinephrine, which is important for alertness or maybe focus. And the primary one of these neurochemicals that are, are targeted by the most common antidepressants that we use today is serotonin. And so you or a loved one may be familiar with these types of drugs. So for example, Prozac and Zoloft. And these are pharmaceutical drugs that end up increasing the levels of serotonin in your synapses. And so I think these drugs have been tremendous at treating depression in many, many patients. However, in about 50% of patients, 
they report that drugs like these have no effect. So this is perhaps called something like treatment-resistant depression. And in fact, sometime in 2008, there was this big review study saying that actually drugs like this, antidepressants, which we thought were going to be an, a panacea, kind of a cure-all for many mental health conditions, weren't as effective as people thought they were. And so this led neuroscientists to start to look at other theories beyond this just neurochemical imbalance theory of what's going on in the brain underlying mental health conditions. And another theory that people like to think about is, OK, rather than just focusing on the neurochemicals, what if we think about what are the actual neurons doing? Like, how are they firing in the brain? And maybe in people suffering from mental health conditions, they have abnormal neural activity patterns in certain brain regions. And so then this inspired this line of uh, research, I think, asking, can we just reset these abnormal patterns of neural activity that we see in these patients to try and help these symptoms. And so in 2008, we received FDA approval for an approach called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And this is a way that we can try and stimulate neurons in one particular region, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this, in patients that are normally completely unresponsive to pharmaceutical drugs, has a massive improvement in their symptoms when they're suffering from treatment-resistant de um, depression. Another type of approach for this stimulation is deep brain stimulation, or DBS. This was first FDA approved for Parkinson's in 1997, and since has been approved for dystonia, epilepsy, and obsessive compulsive disorder. However, it's not yet approved yet for treating major depression disorder. And this is because there are still ongoing clinical trials trying to pinpoint the exact neuroanatomical location that you need to implant these electrodes in to have the best sort of efficacious effect in humans. And so I'll pause here and I'll just you know, recap some of the treatments that I've described that we developed over the past 30 years. So on the one hand, we have these pharmaceutical drugs. And these drugs target a very specific chemical, for example, serotonin. However, they'll target that chemical everywhere in the brain. On the other hand, we have these brain activity stimulation approaches, such as DBS or TMS. And these are great because they can focally target one particular brain area, like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. However, we're not quite sure what the stimulation is doing. We don't know exactly which neurons are getting increased or inhibited, and it's targeting every neuron in that brain region, regardless of the type of neurochemicals it receives. And so I think right now we're at a place where we're in a dire need for new types of therapies that can treat these debilitating conditions. And ideally, they would, be highly, they would have high efficacy, they would be fast acting, and they would be non-invasive so that they could help as many patients as possible. And so how can neuroscience research in the lab, in animals, help us create better therapies for something like a depression or other mental health conditions? So a very first critical question is, what are the specific neurons that we need to hit and that we need to target in order to eliminate these symptoms of these mental health conditions? But not only that, if we then want to go and target them in as many people as possible, it would be great if we could understand what their biochemical makeup is at the protein level. You just heard about that in the previous talk. So that we could develop drugs that can target those very specific neurons that are involved. And the reason that we can do this, um, approach these questions in the mouse, is because in animal models, we have very precise ways and new technologies that allow us to stimulate a precise subset of neurons that we think are relevant for causing a particular set of symptoms. And one such example of a technology that was developed in 2007 in my graduate ad, uh, advisor's lab is called optogenetics. And so before I tell you about how optogenetics works, I'm just going to give you a very quick primer on how the neurons in our brain naturally communicate and fire. And so when two neurons are, are speaking together, one neuron will first send a signal, 
and cause the release of these neurochemicals that we've been talking about. These neurochemicals will then bind to ion channels that are expressed on another neuron. And then these ion channels get activated by these neurochemicals. And that can trigger an influx of sodium into your cells, and this is what causes neuronal firing. Ideally, we would want a way to not have to rely on this neurochemical release to trigger that sodium influx and neuronal firing. We want something that could just cause the neurons to fire whenever you want. And this is the approach that allows us to do that, and we call this optogenetics. And it's really been kind of a game-changing approach in neuroscience research that was just developed um, you know, as, as soon as 2007. And so the core technology of optogenetics was this discovery of light-gated ion channels, or opsins, and these are naturally found in microbial organisms in nature. And so what we can do is we can express these opsins in neurons so that they just sit at the membrane where other ion channels normally sit, and then we shine them with blue light it activates these ion channels, and that causes positive ions to flow in, and this can trigger that same exact mechanism of causing the sodium influx and the action potential firing. So it's great because we can kind of just bypass one step and trigger neural activity with light. These opsins exist in all different types of flavors, so you can have inhibitory opsins when you shine orange light into the brain. It causes negative ions to flow in and this can block naturally occurring neural activity. So the way we can use this in animal research is using a lot of the same approaches that we just heard about. You can take the DNA that encodes an opsin, package it into a harmless viral vector, and inject that virus into the mouse brain. How do we deliver light into the brain? For now, we can implant a very small and flexible optical fiber into the brain and then that can be connected to a cable that just delivers blue light or orange light. So I'm going to show you a video now of this in action. This is one of, I think, the very first times that I saw optogenetics working in a, in a behaving animal. And so this is a mouse that's been injected with one of these excitatory opsins in the motor cortex. And when the researchers shine blue light into the brain, you'll see it light up in a moment, the animal immediately starts moving. And so this is happening in real time and is a result of directly stimulating neurons in the motor cortex. And you'll see as soon as the light turns off, the mouse will stop moving. So this was pretty remarkable to see this happening. And then, of course, we started to wonder, what other brain regions can we then target and stimulate and see how that affects behavior? And I just want to show you another really elegant uh, example where it's something more complex than just simply moving around, but this is doing something like driving some innate drive of, of feeling thirsty. So here they're targeting a very small subpopulation of neurons, and whenever they stimulate them, the animal immediately runs to its water bottle and starts drinking water, even though before it was completely uninterested in drinking. And when they turn that light off, the animal stops drinking water, it stops feeling thirsty, and goes about its normal business. So this is a level of control that we can have now on neural activity and seeing how it affects behavior. So the question is now, can we apply approaches like optogenetics to think about how can we treat symptoms in animal models of mental health conditions like depression? And luckily, many of these uh, behaviors that we see in humans, we can model to some approximation in animals. And I'm going to briefly share two examples with you today about anxiety and a feeling of loss of pleasure. So how do we measure anxiety in a mouse? So one example is something called the elevated plus maze. And so this is a plus-shaped maze that we kind of sit high above the ground. And two of the arms of the maze have, have walls so that when the animal is in those sides of the arms, it feels safe, it can't see anything around it, it's nice and dark. And then the other two arms are completely open, so there are no walls, and the animal can kind of peer over the edge, and it's a little more anxiety producing for them. So when you do this assay, if the mouse tends to stay in these enclosed arms, 
this can correlate with, with something that we read out as feeling anxiety. And then when an animal is less anxious, it'll feel more exploratory, and it'll go out and start to look at the open arms, peer over the edge, et cetera. In 2015, um, researchers found that when you stimulate neurons in the prefrontal cortex in a rodent that are expressing this opsin, they'll become less anxious. So they'll actually, in this, in this very same task, rather than spending most of their time in the enclosed arms, suddenly they'll start going out and exploring these open arms and being much more curious and active. A year later, another study was trying to look at how can we measure something that we call anhedonia in rodents. So anhedonia is just a fancy word for, for when people feel a loss of pleasure. So you, no, normally things that made you feel happy, that brought you joy, you no longer want to do them anymore. The way we study anhedonia in rodents is through something called a sucrose preference test. So there are two water bottles in its cage. It can either drink the plain water or it can go after the sugary water that they really enjoy. And people had found that in genetic animal models of depression, the animals will exhibit a much less uh, lower preference for this sucrose. So this is kind of a readout of anhedonia. And what this study found is that when they optogenetically stimulated the prefrontal cortex, very precisely to when, when those uh, numbers in blue correspond to the days that it's receiving this optogenetic stimulation, just on those days, the animals would exhibit less of a sucrose preference, indicating that they're experiencing this anhedonia. And so wait a minute, I just, I just described to you two studies, one year apart, where in one case they found that optogenically stimulating PSC could reduce symptoms of something like depression. It makes the animals less anxious. And then another study found that it worsens symptoms. It, it makes the mice like feel anhedonia. So what's going on? And it turns out that these are different populations of neurons in this region. And they're sending signals and projections to completely different brain areas in the mouse brain. So if I wanted to go in and try and target this brain area to improve depression, I would want to increase the activity of this purple pathway, while I would want to decrease or lower down this, the activity of the pathway in the red. And so without approaches like optogenetics that we're able to do in the rodents, we never would have been able to tease apart this kind of very subtle pathway distinction. And so this is why uh, these types of techniques are so important for, for looking at the circuitry. And so hopefully from what I just described to you, I've convinced you that neuroscience research in animals um, can help us answer this first question. What are the specific neurons that are relevant? Where are they in the brain? Where do they project to? And these are the ones that we want to target. But then the next big challenge is, okay, let's say I know the neurons. But how am I going to actually influence their neural activity, right? In a human thus far, we don't have a way to pinpoint and say, OK, I'm going to deliver deep brain stimulation just to the neurons in one region that send axon projections here and not there. The technology is not there yet. So instead, to help translate these findings into humans, perhaps we can target them using drugs. And so this is where I think something that a lot of people are starting to work on over the next, and we'll see improvements in over the next 30 years, is can we develop drugs or antidepressants that can recognize just a subset of neurons that we think are important for driving symptoms of depression? And in order to do that, we need to know at the protein level what are the specific targets in these neurons that we need to develop drugs and biochemical um, markers for. And so this, this last part of this puzzle is something that uh, my lab, my new six-month-old lab at UC Davis is working on. And so the way that we're approaching this problem is by first using bioengineering and tool development to try and think of new technologies that allow us to then target, to figure out what proteins are expressed in functionally defined neurons. And then we employ these technologies along with with those like optogenetics and mouse behaviors to test whether they allow us to target relevant neurons. And then we can use genetic approaches such as 
uh, molecular profiling and something called proteomics to actually learn what the proteins are expressed in these cells. And through collaborations with many different centers and other researchers at UC Davis, we can apply these three different approaches to ask how does the brain regulate mood. Specifically, my lab is very interested in looking at this one pathway um, that I highlighted before. So this is from the prefrontal cortex to actually another region called the nucleus accumbens. And we think that perhaps in, in, in patients experiencing certain types of mental health conditions, this pathway is maybe upregulated or overactive. And it would be great if we could figure out a way to dampen down the neurons just in this pathway and see if it improves symptoms of depression. One of the ways in which we're trying to tackle this question is, again, through technology development. So this is a new approach that we developed, um, I guess, a couple of years ago now that we called Flickr. And it's a new type of optogenetics that allows us to detect the neurons that are active during some behavior and then tag them with a molecular tag. This tag can let us know, okay, which neurons were actually activated while the animal was experiencing some, some scary or aversive experience. Then we can isolate just those relevant neurons and then do molecular profiling so that we can ask what proteins are expressed in these cells. And then we're going to ask, can these specific proteins we found serve as drug targets to reduce symptoms of depression first in an animal model and then moving forward? And so the hope for the next 30 years, right, we just summarized a lot of progress that's been made. But the hope looking forward, I think, is first, you know, I, I expect there to be still a lot of emphasis on new drug therapies to try and treat different neurochemical pathways that are thought to be involved in depression. So for example, psychedelic research is something that's really being spearheaded by professors here at UC Davis. Ketamine as well is, is a brand new sort of recent treatment for, for treating depression as well. But on the other hand, I think that we're gonna see a really massive improvements in these types of interventional stimulation technologies to actually alter the brain activity in, inside of humans. And I don't think it's that far off to think that, you know, in maybe 30 years, we'll actually be at the point where we can do something like non-invasive optogenetics in humans. And so in 2018 was actually the very first clinical trial using optogenetics in the retina of a human to restore sight to a patient that was blind and suffering from a hereditary disease where their retinal cells were dying. And so this is just one example of, you know, once we slowly kind of work out, I think, all the, all the safety and the, and the ethical concerns, it's one way that we may see this technology translate into treating human disease. And so that, I think, really what I wanted to emphasize and what I've hopefully been able to share with you today is the need for interdisciplinary research where rather than just focusing on neural stimulation and neural activity or just focusing on what is a certain neurochemical that we need to target, by combining and sort of bridging these two aspects of research, I think that's going to be critical and crucial for leading us to the, uh, a better understanding and eventually an actual cure for these types of mental health conditions I've told you about today. And so even though we are brand new here at Davis, I've, I've really been able to get settled and, and form a sense of community here already. There are two of my students in the back taking pictures. But um, you know, I'm thrilled to be starting my career here. I'm thrilled with the, the support and the community here. And I'm happy to take questions now from anyone about my, our research. Thank you. Um, hi, thank you for speaking. Oh, here I am. Um, I'm just curious about if you were to induce um, long-term potentiation using optogenetics, would it create or could it possibly be used as a way to create like long-term behavioral change without the use of optogenetics afterward? Thank That's you so much. Yes, so the, the question was whether rather than having to use optogenics all the time to sort of change neural activity and stimulate neural activity, could you use it to drive synaptic plasticity, something long-term potentiation? So maybe you could just drive plasticity once 
and then see these long-lasting, long-term effects in neural circuitry and brain health. I think that's a great idea. I haven't seen anyone really start to do that yet, but it's something you could precisely test in a mouse and see, you know, months later, years later, after we've done the, the plasticity effects, do we see long-lasting changes? That's, that's great. I just had a question. Um, what about certain light therapies that are on the market? Would they be similar to what the same effects that you're discussing? Some of them to treat seasonal affective disorder, um, even just decreasing the blue light on your phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is a this is a good point. So some people have um, there have been studies that have shown that blue light alone. For some reason, I don't think we know the mechanism yet, but blue light alone is able to actually alter your neuronal activity. And so I think um, more recently there was one where they'd shown that patients treated with a certain frequency of blue light that seemed to improve, I think, their, their memory in, in an Alzheimer's model and a couple of other studies as well that have, have found that. So that, that's a great point. I think the the because we don't understand how that mechanism works yet, or which brain regions it's actually changing neuronal activity in, optogenetics is trying to be a more precise way. Let's say I, I, I know for sure I need to hit only the neurons in one brain area and hit them with a certain color of light. If you were just you know, delivering blue light by itself, it might cause nonspecific effects as well. Hi, Dr. Kim. Thank you for your talk right here. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to ask if you could touch on the um, advances that are going on with psychedelics as drug therapies. I know it's like a kind of hot topic and controversial field, but I'm curious because I have seen some uh, stuff in the news, especially about the ketamine uh, research, but not about LSD or psilocybin. Yeah, so, you know, the real expert in that is going to be Dr. David Olson, whose entire lab is really focused on asking how can psychedelics help treat symptoms of depression? And he's also developing and synthesizing new chemicals right in his lab that are trying to, to um, sort of pinpoint the same chemicals, the same receptors, but without the, the hallucinogenic effects, right? So that's a major safety concern of using the psychedelics, maybe the, the hallucinogenic effects, whether those are necessary for improving symptoms or not, that, that's a major line of research. And so my lab is actually, we're actually collaborating with Dr. David Olson, and so we're looking at how activity in the prefrontal cortex changes when you inject 5-MeO-DMT um, or you know, a newly synthesized analog TBG from, from David Olson's lab. John Gray also is an expert in, in thinking about how these psychedelics can affect the pharmacology of neurons. And so I, it's an active area of research, and I think Davis is really sort of leading the way in, in that avenue. Last question. I think we had had one here. Yeah. So you didn't talk about ECT at all. And can you just tell us where that uh, falls between the deep brain? I mean, that obviously has been done for many, 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 many years. Exactly, so I, I failed to mention, so I wanted to say before even DBS or TM, TMS were you know, starting to be used in, in clinics, before that, I, I think maybe even before the 1950s, electroconvulsive shock therapy was being used to, to try and reset the neural activity and reset the brain activity. Um, and I think that that, was really crucial for sort of establishing this theory and testing this theory and seeing it work in certain patients. And then from there, the goal moving forward, I think, has been trying to figure out less invasive ways to get the same results, the same improvement in, in symptoms, but in a more focal manner and a, and a maybe more non-invasive manner. So the TMS is trying to do the same thing, but without actually, but you know, with, with a magnet to alter neuronal activity rather than delivering these, these more powerful electrical shocks. Why do you think it's being used more widely now than it used to be with gerontology patients? What is oh. the difference between using it with a young person and an old I, person? 
You know, I'm not, I'm not too sure about that. My, may, it might be something about just the mechanism in which these two different approaches work, how effective they are at actually changing the neural activity. And so if it's something developmental, one approach works better in one versus the other, that may be a reason why. Yeah. Okay. Kim. Okay.